Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. One of the tools I get asked most about in my comments is this little guy. This is a shop-made spring-loaded tap follower, and uh, I have some improvements I want to make, so we're going to make another one, and this time you get to watch. Let's go. Let's start by taking a look at what a tap follower actually does. When we're tapping a hole, we need something to keep the center line of the tap on target. And so taps generally have a center in the back of them. And uh, that's useful if you're using an open backed tap wrench like a Greenfield style, or if you're just using a regular wrench on the tap itself. And very small taps will have a point on the back instead of a typical center because there isn't physically space there for a center. So you have to use these with something that has a negative center on it. Uh, but if you're using a tap wrench such as this Sterrett, it has its own center and it completely encloses the back of the tap, so it doesn't actually matter what type it is. But regardless, uh, the spring-loaded tap follower's role is to uh, go in the back of the tap and uh, you can use it on the mill, you can use it on the drill press, and uh, you can even use it on the lathe. And you can lock whatever quill is pressing on the back of the tap and the spring-loaded action of the tap follower keeps the tap aligned and allows you to move it in and out. So that uh, spring-loaded point there is, is really the key. And the other key is that the entire device is very concentric and so it will keep that tap on the center axis of whatever machine you are using it in. This is a shop-made tap follower that I made several years ago, so let's take a look at how it's built and look at some improvements that I'd like like to make. This is a pretty typical design. The front of it unscrews and uh, inside we have this sliding pointer here and then uh, behind that pointer of course is a spring that makes it all work. Now the weakness of this design is that uh, it relies on uh, the, the center portion of the pointer there doing all of the support because uh, while you're tapping there's side loads on this pointer and ideally you want the front uh, narrow portion of the pointer to be supported as well as the wide portion at the back so there's two points of separation that are spread apart a bit but to achieve that you need a very concentric bore on the tap follower and a very concentric opening in the cap and if the cap is threaded on it's very difficult to achieve that and uh, for some reason I also decided to make the uh, tip in this guy out of a replaceable piece of tool steel that is threaded into this piece of mild steel uh, and uh, that also makes it difficult to keep it concentric because threaded fasteners generally don't hold concentricity. So uh, this whole design here is pretty over engineered and uh, because of that I had to open up the hole in the cap in order to maintain concentricity so I lose that second point of support. I also don't like how thin this pointer is so I want to make one that's beefier and has more lateral rigidity. The other weakness of this design is that because everything near the end is threaded, when you're using a spring-loaded tap follower there are spinning forces on things. The pointer tends to catch the tap and turn and so it has a tendency to unthread itself. And uh, so the cap and the pointer sometimes come unthreaded while you're using it, which is annoying. And the other flaw in this one is, I don't know if you can tell on video, but that pointer is actually slightly bent because I heat treated it. Uh, but didn't, I don't have a surface grinder, so I didn't surface grind it after the heat treating. And as often happens, the heat treating warped it slightly. So we're going to fix all of that with this new design. And this guy has a single piece pointer, so there's nothing to unthread. And the real key to this design is that the hole for the pointer is in the solid end. So the cap that unthreads is in the back. And uh, I've also added a small negative center in the far end so that the pointer can be removed and reversed for using with small taps. And you'll note that the design is asymmetrical because generally if you're using a very small tap you don't need as much travel on that pointer. So the one-piece pointer and the one-piece design at the business end of the tap follower should allow us to achieve excellent concentricity and thus have those two points of support against lateral loads which should make for cleaner and straighter threaded holes. So we'll start by making the main body and here's a trick to find out uh, exactly how much stock you should cut. So measure the length of my jaws here. So we've got 1.5 inches there and then bring your parting tool in as close as you're comfortable to the stock and then measure that distance there. We've got another 0.3, call it 0.5 inches there. We add an inch for Metallicor, the god of machining and we end up with six inches of stock which we can mark and then uh, face this guy off and know that when we pull it out we've got a nice firm grip with our jaws. So we'll start by facing the end as is tradition. And we are going to need tail support for the turning that is to come so we'll throw some anchor lube on there, hashtag not sponsored, and punch a number two center right in there. And now we can pull this guy out to our mark, confident that we have enough room for the parting blade and for the full dimension that we need on our part. And now we can start turning this guy down to dimension. 
So I'm using uh, 12 mil 14 steel here. You could use mild steel. Uh, you could even use tool steel if you're up for it. Uh, whatever works for you. It, uh, there's not a lot of stresses on this uh, tool, honestly, so it's pretty easy going as far as what material you use. So uh, I'm just turning this guy down to a 500 thou outer dimension. And again, the dimensions on this are all pretty flexible. I would suggest making the outer diameter of the body something uh, standard, like in, in the Imperial case, 500 thousandths, because that will allow you to put it in a Jacob's Chuck or in a collet. And on the mill in particular, being able to put it in a collet often saves you a ton of vertical real estate. So I'm shooting for 500, and I landed on 499 and 9 tenths. In some shops, that gets you fired. In the Blondie Hacks shop, that gets you promoted. Now we're gonna make that inner bore, and rather than disrupt the part in the chuck, I'm going to bring in the steady rest, and that will provide some lateral stability just to keep it from wandering off course during the drilling, because we do have a lot of stick out there, so there's gonna be some flexibility. So I bring in the steady rest here and set this guy up. On my to-do list is to do a complete rebuild on this steady rest. As with many budget machine tools, the accessories like this are pretty mediocre, but uh, this guy will get the job done for us. And I'll check the run out on the far end just to make sure I haven't distorted anything with the steady rest and it looks good. Making a very deep bore with a flat bottom is actually very difficult, so instead I've accounted for the 118 degree drill point in my drawing, and uh, Fusion 360 will tell me how deep I need to go with that drill to create that little bit of a shoulder. So it'll just be sort of like a, a fudge area that uh, is inside that bore. So you can see we need to drill to 2.83 inches, but one of the limitations of small lathes like this is they have limited quill travel on the tail stock. So instead what I'm doing is just uh, marking the depth on the drill itself and not using the quill markings. And this is obviously less precise than using the hand wheel and the markings on the quill, but uh, I've just allowed 40 or 50 thousandths of uh, wiggle room in the design so that I don't have to be super precise with this design and I don't risk punching through to the far side. This particular lathe advertises a whopping three inches of quill travel on the tailstock, but uh, the, the anti-rotation tang on the taper that holds the Jacob Chuck actually costs you another half an inch. So yeah, these are the little things that uh, are not in the brochure, but uh, we can make it work by marking the drill. So I drilled out the entire bore to one size under a quarter inch because that's the size of the pointer hole at the end. And then I drilled and reamed the body out to 5 16 because that's the size of the larger inner bore. And then once that's done, then I go back in with a quarter inch reamer and finish the hole at the end. So I end up with a quarter inch hole and a 5 16 bore, both very concentric and precisely dimensioned. Next we need to make the smaller diameter for the threaded portion where the cap goes on. And uh, here's an easier order of operations. Do this before you do the drilling I just showed while you still have the center in place. I didn't think to do that uh, this time, so uh, I'm going to do it with the steady rest in place. So uh, I've just set my tool on the end of the part, and then I'm counting back the 430 thou that I want for the depth on this, and then I re-zero my indicator, and now I can start turning that shoulder down. And I'm getting some chatter here, so it uh, seems that my steady rest isn't quite tight enough, so I snug that up a little bit, and now it's cutting well. And now I'm cutting those threads using my tailstock die holder. If you don't have one of these, you can also just use a die wrench and hold the die wrench square by pressing the uh, face of the tailstock quill up against it. That works just fine as well. And we'll deburr that guy while we've got it set up here. And next we're going to mark where to part this guy off. And I started the parting operation, but uh, we're working pretty far from the chuck here, and it's a hollow tube, so it's not very structurally sound. So I was getting some chatter. So uh, this wasn't going to work very well, so instead I brought in the tailstock. And uh, now you don't normally want to part with the tailstock in place, but what I'm doing here is just going in most of the way, uh, getting through the tough part. And then once I'm almost done, then I pull the tailstock out for safety. And Yahtzee. And a little deep burr on that, and Bob's your uncle. I got a pretty good finish with that parting blade, so I'm not going to bother facing the end, but uh, you certainly could flip it around and face that if you wanted to. 
Next we're going to make the cap shown there in yellow and once again that involves a fairly precise drilling operation and once again I've just marked the drill point in the drawing and taken that measurement 6169 so I can hit that guy with the drill so here's an easy way to do that I just use my machinist scale and bring the drill up and then I use the tailstock quill to measure the depth from there and then the thickness of the machinist scale basically gives me a margin of error and then I tap the threads for the cap. And you'll notice that I'm cheating and using my old tap follower here to make the new one. If you don't have one of those, there's other ways to do this. Check out my video on using taps and dies on the lathe for lots of other approaches that also work. So I've gone in with a taper tap and now I'm going in with a bottoming tap to get as many threads in there as I can. And we'll do a test fit of the body into our cap here. And if you're an experienced machinist, you know this isn't going to work very well. There's always going to be a gap there. And that's because it's basically impossible to cut threads right to the base of a shoulder. So we're going to make a little relief. So here's a quick and easy way to do that. I just go in with a 7 16th drill, which is the size of my thread, the major diameter of my thread. And then just send that in 100 thou. Creates a little counter bore there. And now our cap thread's on very nicely. You could also do that with a boring bar or other fancy methods, but just using the big drill works. And now I align the far edge of my parting blade with the end of my part and put an indicator on there and count in the length of my part that I want. A little sanity check with the caliper, make sure I'm in the right spot. And then go ahead and part this guy off to length. And Yahtzee. And then we'll flip that guy around and face off the end. And I'm gripping this quite lightly because this is a thin-walled hollow tube. But for a light facing operation like this, we don't need a turbo grip on the chuck. All right, so there's the body and the cap looking fine. And uh, we'll double check, make sure that guy assembles nicely. And that's looking really good. And here's a dirty little secret for you. I actually made these parts twice because I misread the drawing the first time and made it the wrong length. So that's how I happen to have the other footage of cutting the relief area on the end in a different order of operations. All right, now onto the pointer there shown in teal, and I'm gonna make this out of a single piece of 01 tool steel. In the US, we typically call this drill rod. So I cut it to length. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with the four jaw because we're gonna to need to maintain concentricity here uh, through multiple operations. And the nice thing about drill rod is that the outside of it is precision ground, so it's quite easy to get it dialed in very precisely. Now I'm going to face this and punch a center in it, but if you have a negative center for your tailstock, a better order of operations would be to put the point on now and then use the negative center to hold that for the rest of the operations. But I don't have that, so I'll show you the other way to do it. So put a center in there, traditional style, and I dial this guy in again because anytime you move the part, you've probably lost concentricity. And of course, putting the tailstock in there influences concentricity as well. And then I mark my dimensions on there just to get a sense of where things are. And I don't know, I always do that right away and it's always pointless because then I immediately start turning and I remove all those marks. I, I don't know why I do that. It's just a thing. So after that first pass, we are actually very close because this uh, stock is only a little bit larger than the final diameter that I need. So we'll do a finishing pass and I'm actually leaving this one thou large. And you'll see why here in a moment. And I'll also deburr that end while I have the chance. So as I said, we are a bit large and uh, we need a really precision fit on this pointer. And uh, of course it doesn't fit yet. So what I'm going to do is finish this off with emery paper so we can really dial in the tenths on this fit. And of course you'll notice I've got uh, protection on my ways there because you don't want to shower those with grinding grit. I'm starting with some 320 grit here. And uh, I use this to get it down to dimension. And uh, basically, uh, just to make it perfect, what I'm doing is actually just test fitting with the tube over and over. I'm not just assuming that the reaming operation left the inner bore as some perfect dimension. I'm actually just fitting it bespoke, if you will, to that tube. And then once I've got the fit perfect, then I go back in with some 800 grit emery paper and smooth out the grinding marks for a perfect sliding fit. So with the major diameter established, now I can go ahead and mark for the smaller diameter at one end. And this is going to be the negative center end used with small taps because we've already put a center in it. So I'm bringing back in my dead center this time instead of the live center because I need more space to get in close, as you can see here, to turn down that diameter. And that diameter is uh, needs to be as close to precisely 250 as I can get because that's the hole that we reamed in the end of the body for the pointers to come out of. And again, I'm just test fitting that little by little until it is perfect. 
And then I can polish that guy up again with some 800 grit emery paper. And then a quick deeper, and that end is done. And now I'm marking the inner diameter, and this is the main pointer area, so we'll blue that up and mark it for length as well. And this guy I'm just coming in with a sharp nose tool and plunging in directly. You can see I've brought the live center back in for support there. I'm taking light passes here because there's a limit to how much you can plunge straight in with a pointed cutting tool like that. Pretty soon it turns into a form tool. And once again, finishing a bit large and using emery cloth to dial down that fit perfectly. Now we can't test fit this inner diameter. However, we know from the outer diameter at the other end exactly what size is a perfect fit. So I'm making this inner diameter uh, exactly the same as the outer one down to the tenth. Here's our part so far, and you can see how that fine emery paper almost makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Now we need to part this off, but we're working kind of far from the chuck here, and this is tool steel, it's tough going, so I'm not going to try to part it off in the lathe, instead I pulled it out, and I'm parting it off, if you will, with a hacksaw. As I said in my parting video, there's no shame in using a hacksaw when the time is right. So now I'm going to put this back in the fore jaw and flip it around, but uh, my usual copper soft jaws are a little too thick, and so I can't hold the small diameter. So instead I've got a soda can on there to protect the part from the jaws, and I'm dialing it back in. Now we have to grip on the larger diameter, which leaves us with a lot of stick out. I wasn't sure if this would actually work, but it did. Plan B was to use a split block like this, which allows you to clamp down on the part and then you clamp the larger block in the jaws and that allows you to work on a smaller diameter that's outboard of a larger diameter. Next we're going to set up our compound to turn the 60 degree point on the end of this. 60 degrees is the sort of standard taper that's used on centers for uh, lathe tooling and of course also taps. And uh, be mindful of your markings on this. Remember that Chinese lathes have 0, 90 degrees different from American lathes. So watch for that. And now we start turning our point. And if you haven't seen this technique before, it's pretty simple. You lock down the carriage, you use the cross slide to set your depth of cut, and you do the actual passes with the compound set at the angle. And that, that creates the angle on the end of the part there that we want. And uh, this is a very, very easy way to make tapers. The uh, disadvantage to it is that you're limited by the amount of travel that you have on your compound, which on small lathes like this is not very much. I've only got about two and a half or three inches of compound travel. But for a small point like this, it's just the thing. And you can decide how far to take this down. I didn't go all the way to a completely razor sharp point because I'm not going to be hardening this. So I figured uh, eh, if I make a really sharp point, it's just going to break off anyway. So then I uh, removed the tool marks once again with some emery paper. And there's our final pointer looking pretty sharp. Well, not that sharp because I left the end a little blunt. So we'll do a test fit in the normal use direction, and that fit is great. So it looks like we achieved our concentricity and our dimensions that we were hoping for. That feels really, really good. Now over on the other end, if we would flip it around to use for small taps, the news is less good. It goes in as it did before, but it gets stopped right where the end uh, should be poking through the small bore at the end. And uh, so just to make sure there wasn't some grit or a little bit of a burr or something in there. I ran the 5 16th reamer back in there by hand and just to make sure there wasn't some tiny taper or something in the end. Now we know the major diameter is good and we know the smaller diameter is good because it fits through by itself. So that can only mean one thing, we have a concentricity problem. So uh, I'm going to compensate by just reducing the diameter of the smaller end here a little bit. So I won't have quite as good support from the bore on the end as I'd hoped, but this end is short anyway so it doesn't matter that much and we'll give it another go here. So I took another couple of tenths off of that guy. And now it fits in there pretty well, but uh, the stick out is very, very short. So I double checked my lengths here. I've got a half inch there, but here's the thing. Remember the reamer is how we made that shoulder and you can see how the reamer doesn't get all the way to the end because there's a bit of a rounded end on reamers and there's also that 118 degree drill point in there. So that all cost us a fair bit of length. So uh, in the end, the negative drill end didn't work out great, but uh, the main end is awesome. I can't feel any lateral play in that at all, so really, really happy with this end. Now we need some springs, so it's over to the toy box to see what I've got. And I think something like these guys will work well. This, is a, this spring has a good length, but uh, it's not really stiff enough. I kind of want two of them, so I could put them in back to back like that, which would be a, a fun surprise for, for later me. It's like one of those cans of snakes, but you know, that actually takes your eye out. 
and uh, that's that's going to work but uh, I want to kind of combine these two springs so here's a little trick if you have a length that you like but you need the spring to be stiffer you can kind of weave them together like this and make one stiffer spring you lose a little bit of travel doing this uh, but it's an easy way to uh, get around not having the exact right spring you want this spring tension to be pretty high because it has to resist the lateral loads on the tap, but not too high that it's jamming the tap in there and threatening to deform your threads or something like that. So that feels just about right. Okay, but how do we end up with that concentricity problem on the other end? Because we made that part all in one setup, right? Well, not exactly. There was a moment where I switched out to using my dead center for clearance. And in principle, centers are all the same, but in practice, especially when you're talking about the 10 thousandths levels of precision that I'm going for with this fit, the different center could have made a difference. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that my live center may actually not be good enough for the levels of precision that I'm trying to achieve with this part. So let's actually check the runout on my live center. You see I've actually got about half a thousandth here, and that seems like a lot, and well it is, but uh, let's see why that is by going live center shopping. Here's the live center I'm using. It's from a Little Machine Shop, and it's very hobbyist friendly priced at $25, but there's no accuracy listed for it, which should concern you in itself. So let's look at a comparable model on MSC, and this guy is $67, and this guy does list its precision in millimeters at 0.01, and that's 4 tenths, so that's pretty comparable to what I'm getting on mine. Well, here's a Riten live center, and uh, let's look at its accuracy. Oh, look at that. Zero runout measurable. Oh, and it's $560. Want to spend even more? This Royal Products Live Center is $1,100. I guess the name means only the queen can afford it. But maybe that number might be in binary, in which case it's only $13.02. I'll try sending MSC $13 and see if they send me that Live Center. But the point of all this is that you do get what you pay for, and if so if you're trying to hit tenths, diameters, and maintain perfect concentricity, as I'm trying to do here, you will start running into the limits of budget machine tooling. Okay, but let's finish up our part. So I'm gonna do a cold bluing here, which I like to do on my tools, it looks nice. So the first step is to clean it up with acetone. All of these cold bluing chemicals require the part to be absolutely spotlessly clean. And I'm using Brownells Oxfo Blue here, which is kind of my favorite. And uh, this guy just wipes on with a cotton swab and it's pretty much magic. If your surface finish is good on the part and it's clean, then uh, it just instantly turns a perfect oxide black. It's pretty awesome stuff. And then we'll do the cap as well. And you just let that sit for a minute and then wipe off any excess. And a nice finishing touch is to rub some light oil on there for extra corrosion protection. I found this to be optional. If your surface finish is good, the black oxide gives you a little bit of extra protection against rust. Okay, let's do some final assembly here. So our pointer goes in like so. And that fit is still good, which is good because nothing's changed. And we put our springs in there and our cap goes on the end. And that, my friends, is a spring-loaded tap follower. So out with the old, in with the new. You can see the difference in quality between those two parts. That's the difference that several years of experience in machining makes. I hope you've enjoyed watching this and I hope you'll make your own tap follower. Check out my Patreon for the drawings and I'll see you next time.